Dr. Sage here. In this video, we're going to be discussing the main themes of microbiology, and we're going to start by talking about the different types of microorganisms. What you should expect to understand by the end of this video is to be able to identify and differentiate the six major types of microorganisms, describe the role and impact of microbes on the earth, and describe the three domains of life and understand how they fit within the tree or web of life. So let's begin with a brief description of the six major groups of microorganisms. We start with the smallest type. Those are the acellular microorganisms, so they're not actually made out of cells. These would be prions and viruses. Then we have the microorganisms that are made out of cells, the prokaryotes being the smaller type. This would include the bacteria. And then we have the eukaryotes, which are bigger than the prokaryotes. And in the eukaryotes, we have things like fungi, protozoa, and helminths. Now, technically, helminths are not a microorganism. They are multicellular animals whose mature form is visible to the naked human eye. So, speaking of sizes, most microorganisms cannot be seen directly. Instead, they need to be visualized using a microscope. Now, using a light microscope, you can easily see things like animal cells and plant cells. Or, as applicable to this course, Eukaryotic cells that are microorganisms that we can see with a light microscope include the fungi and the protozoa. As I said, the helminths, actually you can see with your eyes, you don't need a light microscope to see them, at least they're adult versions. Then, much smaller but than the eukaryotic cells, we have the prokaryotic cells like bacteria. However, we can still see the vast majority of the bacteria using a light microscope. Now the microorganisms are smaller than that, that would be the viruses and the prions. We can't see those with our naked eyes. In order to see those, we need to use a different type of microscope called an electron microscope. So now let's go into the details of the different types of microorganisms, starting with the prions. So prions are a misfolded rogue form of a natural protein found in the cell. This rogue prion protein, which may be caused by genetic mutation or occur spontaneously, can be infectious, stimulating other endogenous normal proteins to become misfolded. Now you may or may not have heard of prions before. If you have, one of the ways you most likely have heard about it is in bovine encephalitis or mad cow disease, which is a prion disease that obviously affects cows and it can affect humans who eat the infected cows. Then we have viruses. Viruses consist of proteins and genetic material, either DNA or RNA, but never both that are inert outside of the host organism. However, by incorporating themselves into the host cell, viruses are able to co-opt the host cellular mechanisms to multiply and affect other hosts. Examples of viruses, one that we're very familiar with nowadays is coronavirus, or another example is the Ebola virus. Now, for the cellular microorganisms, we have eukaryotes, which include fungi. Now, unicellular fungi called yeasts are included within the study of microbiology. There's more than a thousand known species of yeasts. They're found in many different environments, from deep in the sea to the human navel. Some yeasts have beneficial uses, such as causing bread to rise and beverages to ferment, but yeasts can also cause food to spoil. Some even cause diseases, such as yeast infections or oral thrush. Continuing with the eukaryotic microorganisms, we have the protozoa, which are very diverse. Some are free-living, whereas others are parasitic, only able to survive by extracting nutrients from a host organism. Most protozoa are harmless, but some are pathogens that can cause disease in animals or humans. For example, this giardia is an intestinal protozoan parasite that infects humans and other mammals, causing severe diarrhea. Then we have the helmets. These are multicellular parasitic worms, and they're not technically microorganisms, as most are large enough to see without a microscope. However, these worms fall within the field of microbiology because diseases caused by helmets involve microscopic eggs and larvae. Here's an example where an adult worm, a helmet, is removed through a lesion in the patient's skin by winding it around a matchstick. Okay, so we've had a brief introduction to the acellular microorganisms, the prions and the viruses, and we have a brief introduction to the eukaryotic microorganisms. We haven't talked about the prokaryotes yet, but let's define some differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. So eukaryotes have membrane-bound organelles, for example, a nucleus. 
Examples of eukaryotes are things you're familiar with, such as animals, plants, fungi, which is like a mushroom, which is not a plant. Um, it's a eukaryote, but not a plant. And protists, until this course, you probably haven't heard much about. Then we have the prokaryotes, which do not have membrane-bound organelles. So they don't have a nucleus, for example. The prokaryotes are the bacteria, which we'll talk a lot about in this course, and the archaea, which we'll only briefly mention in this course. All right, so what are prokaryotes? Well, first, they're very tiny. Most are microscopic, generally much smaller than eukaryotes. Second, they're single-celled or unicellular, whereas most eukaryotes are multicellular. So you're eukaryotes, you're made out of trillions of cells. But prokaryotes, like a bacteria, is only one cell big. However, they can stick together to form associations and biofilms, so we'll talk about later in the semester. Prokaryotes are numerous. They outnumber and outweigh all of the eukaryotes combined. In fact, fun gross fact, you are more bacteria than you are human. The ratio of bacteria cells living in and on us is about tenfold larger than the number of human cells that make you up. Now, by weight, you're more human than bacteria because eukaryotic cells are much larger than prokaryotic cells, but by number, you are more bacteria than human. Prokaryotes are ubiquitous. You find them basically everywhere, deep in the Earth's crust, in the polar ice caps, in the oceans, and inside the bodies of plants and animals. Prokaryotes are the backbone of our ecosystems. They were the first living inhabitants of the planet Earth. They're key players in the carbon and nitrogen cycle. For example, living organisms are decomposed, and that's accomplished by bacteria, which are prokaryotes, and fungi, which are eukaryotes, and that results in the breakdown of dead matter and waste as those nutrients can be reused. Additionally, when you think about photosynthesis, you typically, most people typically think about plants. But photosynthetic microorganisms, bacteria, which are prokaryotes, they're called blue-green or cyanobacteria, and algae, which are eukaryotes, but they're protists, not plants, account for more than 70% of the Earth's photosynthesis contributing to the majority of the oxygen in the atmosphere. So most of the oxygen in the air you're breathing isn't coming from plants. It's coming from microorganisms. Prokaryotes are very diverse. They are the oldest, structurally simplest, and most abundant forms of life. They were abundant for over a billion years before eukaryotes evolved. 90 to 99% of the prokaryotes are unknown and undescribed only less than 1% of prokaryotes actually cause diseases. The prokaryotes fall into two domains, bacteria, which we're gonna talk about a lot in this class, and archaea, which like I said, we don't talk about much in this class. Many of the archaea are extremophiles, which means they live in very extreme environments, like hot springs or very high salt concentration water where other organisms wouldn't be able to survive. So if we think about these different types of organisms living on the planet, all of the organisms living on the planet fit into one of three domains. That's the domain eukarya, made up of eukaryotes. So that would be things like animals, plants, fungi, and protists. And then you have the prokaryotes, which is the domain archaea and the domain bacteria. So all living things fit into those three domains. The ancestor of modern archaea is believed to have given rise to the eukaryotes. So you have the prokaryotes, bacteria, and archaea, and then it's believed that the eukarya evolved from an ancestor that included the archaea. Another way of looking at the tree of life could be represented like this. You have the eukaryotes shown in red, including things like you're used to think about, like yourself, animals, fungi, plants, and then a bunch of protists, which we'll talk about these protists, some of these protists in this course. You have the archaea, which the eukaryotes split off from. Uh, we won't talk about these much in this course. And then you have the bacteria, which we'll focus a lot of time on our course learning about the different bacteria. Now, you most often see the tree of life represented something like this. However, this representation leaves out an important fact. The tree of life is realistically more like a web of life. Okay, it's not a straight path to get somewhere. Okay, it's a branching tree. But in addition to that, these branches intersect each other then because of something called horizontal gene transfer. Horizontal gene transfer is when genes are transferred from one organism, one species, to a different species. So for example, in the bacteria, cyanobacteria, 
genes were transferred into modern day plants and that's why uh, plants do photosynthesis because of the genes from the cyanobacteria. So we more realistically think about the tree of life as actually a web of life where genes are being transferred horizontally between different species. Or a more entertaining version of that, this would be the web of life. You have the bacteria that evolved the earliest, okay, and then splitting off from the bacteria were the archaea, and then from the archaea came the eukaryotes. But remember, there's a lot of interaction horizontally between these organisms. So that's a very brief introduction to the different types of microorganisms, which we're going to go into depth learning about them throughout this course. This is just your cursory introduction. Until next time, this has been Dr. Sage.